The legendary Joni Mitchell has been making music since the 1960s, with a sound that incorporates elements of folk, rock, jazz, and classical. She's influenced generations of singers and songwriters. Keep watching to discover what you might not know about her. Mitchell was born Roberta Joan Anderson on November 7, 1943, in Alberta, Canada. Her parents, Bill and Myrtle, worked as a grocer and school teacher, respectively. After World War II, the family moved to North Battleford, Saskatchewan, before settling in Saskatoon when Joni was nine years old. I guess everybody knows you're from Canada. That same year, Mitchell was hospitalized with a serious case of polio. While recovering, she started to sing and perform for other patients, thus essentially performing the first concerts of her life. Before her illness, she'd expressed an interest in music, but stopped piano lessons after her teacher criticized her for wanting to play her own songs. After she got out of the hospital, she prayed for her legs to recover. She then went on to join the church choir, which is unfortunately where she was introduced to cigarettes. Mitchell's magnum opus 1971 album Blue includes the track Little Green, which is reportedly about a child that she gave up for adoption back when she was only 21. At the time, she was an unknown folk singer, and the pregnancy resulted from a relationship with a Calgary artist named Brad McMath. As the song reveals, he soon abandoned Mitchell and their unborn child for the warmer climates of California. She went on to marry a fellow folk singer named Chuck Mitchell, although that soon fell apart as well. Mitchell hit her big break soon after the adoption, leaving her feeling guilty for giving up a daughter she could now support, an experience that directly inspired Blue. Mother and daughter would eventually meet in 1997, but according to Mitchell, it took a while for the two of them to reconcile. As she told the Toronto Star in 2013, she was pretty rough on me and conscripted my granddaughter, but we've worked through all of that. And I see it written again and again and again that, <laughs> that I gave up my daughter to further my career. This is so wrong. There was no career. In 2000, Mitchell told The Globe and Mail that she sees herself as a painter first. As she put it, I've always thought of myself as a painter derailed by circumstance. I sing my sorrow and I paint my joy. She also rejects the notion of herself as a mere Sunday painter, insisting, I probably spend more of my time painting than most of my friends who are full-time painters. According to Mitchell, she takes a painterly approach to her music. Instead of focusing on chord structure, she tries to find what she calls internal twisting, which comes as a result of mixing different tones at once. Mitchell sold her visual art while she was still in high school, and many of her album covers feature her own artwork. In addition to exhibiting her paintings, she's released a book of drawings and watercolors paired with poetry and lyrics. Originally titled The Christmas Book, she gave 100 copies out to friends in 1971. In 2019, it was re-released as Morning Glory on the Vine in celebration of Mitchell's 75th birthday. How did music become the career? Because I got pregnant. I got pregnant. I was the only virgin in art school, right? By 1969, Joni Mitchell was an established singer-songwriter. She'd scored a hit when Judy Collins covered her song Both Sides Now in 1967, and she was a fixture in the Laurel Canyon scene. Many of her peers gave celebrated performances at Woodstock, the 1969 three-day festival that's widely considered the apex of the era's counterculture movement. But as for Mitchell herself, she was scheduled to appear on The Dick Cavett Show and thus couldn't attend. As she prepared for the show, her boyfriend Graham Nash of the band Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young came into her hotel room while still high from his performance at the festival. On The Dick Cavett Show, Mitchell was joined by Jefferson Airport Plains Grace Slick, as well as Stephen Stills and David Crosby, who all talked about the festival. Mitchell took what she heard and wrote the song Woodstock, which tells the story of people gathering at the festival to form a utopia free from the pains of war. So even though Mitchell wasn't able to attend the festival, Woodstock would go on to become one of her most popular songs. A year after Woodstock, Mitchell and many of her musical peers traveled to England to perform at the 1970 Isle of Wight Festival, alongside a lineup that included the likes of Jimi Hendrix and The Who. 
However, the peace and love of Woodstock didn't make its way to England, and Mitchell felt the brunt of it, as the festival was a terrible experience for her. Then uh, the festival began, which was a bit of a disaster. Mitchell was asked to move her performance from the evening to the mid-afternoon. By this time, the crowd of 600,000 people had grown agitated by the strong security presence, the expensive ticket prices, and the performers arriving in expensive clothing and cars. During her set, Mitchell stopped to ask the crowd to calm down, which only increased the hostility. While musicians who used electric instruments could overpower the rowdy audience, Mitchell was armed with just an acoustic guitar, a dulcimer, and a piano. At one point, a man who'd been sitting by Mitchell's piano named Yogi Joe grabbed the microphone and attempted to speak, only to be led away by security. This only served to agitate the crowd even more. As Mitchell later said about the festival's organizers, they fed me to the beast. Joni Mitchell has released a number of critically and commercially acclaimed albums throughout the course of her career, but one of them stands tall above the rest, 1971's Blue. In 2012, Rolling Stone ranked it number 30 on its list of the 500 greatest albums of all time, and then in a revamped version in 2020, it moved all the way up to number 3. Mitchell herself has described it as, quote, probably the purest emotional record that I will ever make in my life. And in 1979, she told Rolling Stone, There's hardly a dishonest note in the vocals. At that period of my life, I had no personal defenses. I felt like a cellophane wrapper on a pack of cigarettes. I felt like I had absolutely no secrets from the world, and I couldn't pretend in my life to be strong or to be happy. The album became Mitchell's first to sell over a million copies, and it's been cited by such other legendary artists as Prince, Taylor Swift, and Bob Dylan. While Mitchell would go on to make many more successful albums, Blue remains her most iconic achievement. In the era of free love, Mitchell connected with many of her musical partners romantically, including two of the three members of the supergroup Crosby, Stills & Nash. In 1967, Mitchell began to work on her debut album Song to a Seagull with David Crosby as the producer. The two began a relationship, although it soon soured. As music journalist David Brown wrote in his book Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, the wild, definitive saga of rock's greatest supergroup, Crosby would, quote, revel in presenting her to his friends, treating her like a prized, talented possession. Also in 1967, Mitchell met poet and songwriter Leonard Cohen at the Newport Folk Festival. The pair became friends and had a short fling, remaining close until Cohen's death in 2016. Their relationship served as the inspiration for Mitchell's song, Rainy Night House. Then, in 1968, Mitchell began a two-year relationship with Graham Nash. The Crosby, Stills & Nash song, Our House, written by Nash, was inspired by their home life. Eventually, that relationship also faded, with Mitchell breaking up with Nash by writing him a letter. Mitchell then became involved with yet another singer-songwriter in 1971, when she and James Taylor got together. Both of them would go on to be inspired to write songs about their relationship, but as their musical paths diverged, so did their romantic relationship. You know, she, she made some beautiful stuff. Like Joni Mitchell, Neil Young was born and raised in Canada before moving to the United States and becoming part of the 60s counterculture movement. The two of them first crossed paths in Canada in 1964 at the Fourth Dimension Folk Club at the University of Manitoba. Both of them have gone on to be widely considered among the greatest singer-songwriters of all time. They've remained very close to each other throughout their careers, as they've played on each other's albums and even written songs to each other. When Young was just 19, he wrote the song Sugar Mountain as a lament about growing up and becoming an adult. In response, Mitchell penned The Circle Game, which appeared on her 1970 album, Ladies of the Canyon. Unlike Sugar Mountain, it wasn't a gloomy take about growing old, as it instead offered a more positive perspective of growing up and developing new dreams. The song features the character of a boy, with the last verse seeing him growing to the age of 20. Then in 1973, Young wrote a tribute to Mitchell called Sweet Joni. Their paths crossed again that decade in 1976 when they performed together in the band's Farewell Concert, which was filmed for the Martin Scorsese-directed documentary The Last Waltz. Joni Mitchell has never been afraid of playing around with the genre and incorporating different styles into her music. As Bob Dylan once told Rolling Stone, Joni's got a strange sense of rhythm that's all her own. 
In 1975, Mitchell left behind the Laurel Canyon sound and released the album The Hissing of Summer Lawns. Featuring jazz overtones, it leaned away from the acoustic sound typical of her early work. Despite poor reaction from fans and critics, she pushed forward with this trend throughout the decade. In a 1979 interview with Rolling Stone, she detailed her evolution with experimental jazz. As she put it, you have two options. You can stay the same and protect the formula that gave you your initial success. They're going to crucify you for staying the same. If you change, they're going to crucify you for changing. But staying the same is boring, and change is interesting. So of the two options, I'd rather be crucified for changing. On her 1979 album, Mingus, Mitchell worked with notable jazz stars Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter. The record was named in tribute to her friend, legendary jazz bassist and composer Charles Mingus, who also collaborated with her on the album and died five months before it was released. While some of Mitchell's contemporaries like Paul McCartney and Neil Young have been able to continue releasing new albums into the 2020s, she has instead been forced into early retirement. A big reason why is because she suffers from Morgellons disease, which has limited her mobility. As she described the condition to the Los Angeles Times in 2010, Fibers in a variety of colors protrude out of my skin like mushrooms after a rainstorm. They cannot be forensically identified as animal, vegetable, or mineral. In 2013, Mitchell told the Toronto Star that she hadn't been able to do much of anything, though non-Western medicine had helped her deal with the disease. And as she wrote in her 2014 autobiography, Joni Mitchell, in her own words, I couldn't wear clothing. I couldn't leave my house for several years. Sometimes it got so I'd have to crawl across the floor. My legs would cramp up just like a polio spasm. It hit all of the places where I had polio. That wasn't Mitchell's only recent health struggle, as she also suffered a brain aneurysm in 2015. She was found unconscious in her Los Angeles home and has made few public appearances since then. Nevertheless, despite her recent struggles, her legacy remains clear. Even if she never releases another album, the world is richer thanks to all she's already contributed. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite musicians are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.